Well, I'd like to ask you if you can read a little bit from Vampires sure. in the Lemon Grove Forest, starting right at the very beginning. Okay. So this is Vampires in the Lemon Grove. In October, the men and women of Sorrento harvest the primo fiore, or first flowering fruit, the most succulent lemons. In March, the yellow bianchetti ripen, followed in June by the green verdelli. In every season, you can find me sitting at my bench, watching them fall. Only one or two lemons tumble from the branches each hour, but I've been sitting here so long, their falls seem contiguous, close as raindrops. My wife has no patience for this sort of meditation. Jesus Christ, Clyde, she says, you need a hobby. Most people mistake me for a small, kindly Italian grandfather, a nono. I have an old nono's coloring, the dark walnut stain peculiar to southern Italians, a tan that won't fade until I die, which I never will. I wear a neat periwinkle shirt, a canvas sun hat, black suspenders that sag at my chest. My loafers are battered but always polished. The few visitors to the lemon grove who notice me smile blankly into my raisin face and catch the whiff of some sort of tragedy. They whisper that I'm a widower or an old man who has survived his children. They never guess that I'm a vampire. Santa Francesca's Lemon Grove, where I spend my days and nights, was part of a Jesuit convent in the 1800s. Today, it's privately owned by the Alberti family. The prices are excessive, and the locals know to buy their lemons elsewhere. In summers, a teenage girl named Fila mans a wooden stall at the back of the grove. She's painfully thin with heavy black bangs. I can tell by the careful way she saves the best lemons for me, slyly kicking them under my bench, that she knows I am a monster. Sometimes the girl smiles vacantly in my direction, but she never gives me any trouble. And because of her benevolent indifference to me, I feel a swell of love for the girl. Fila makes the lemonade and monitors the hot dog machine, watching the meat rotate on wire spigots. I am fascinated by this machine. The Italian name for it translates as carousel of beef. Who would have guessed at such a device 200 years ago? Back then, we were all preoccupied with visions of apocalypse. Santa Francesca, the foundress of this very grove, gouged out her eyes while dictating premonitions of fire. What a shame, I often think, that Santa Francesca foresaw only the end times, never hot dogs. That is Karen Russell reading from Vampires in the Lemon Grove, the title story of her new collection of short stories, right after proving up perhaps the scariest story in the collection. And I know of at least one individual who read Proving Up before going to bed at night and found that she couldn't sleep after it scared she scared her. <laughs> oh, what a victory. I'm so glad. Yes, that would be our producer, Taylor I'm Bernie. So glad. But right after proving up, we <laughs> enter a more lighthearted world populated by former presidents reincarnated as horses. First, I'd like you to read us a passage from that story, The Barn at the End of Our Term. Okay, well, let me find that. That's You set it up. That's I've it. I've already <laughs> found it. Page okay. 115. So here we go. <laughs> the barn. And as Kojo said, this is just a bunch of American presidents reincarnated uh, in the bodies of uh, horses. The barn is part of a modest horse farm, its pastures rolling forward into a blank, mist-cloaked horizon. The landscape is flat and corn yellow and empty of people. In fact, the prairies look a lot like the grasslands of Kentucky. There are ant hills everywhere impossibly huge, heaped like dirt monsters. There are 22 stalls in the barn. Eleven of the stabled horses are, as far as Rutherford can ascertain, former presidents of the United States of America. The other stalls are occupied by regular horses, who give the presidents suspicious sidelong looks. Rutherford behaves as a skewbald pinto with a golden cowlick and a cross-eyed stare. Rutherford hasn't made many inroads with these regular horses, the Clydesdales are cliquish and pink-gummed, and the Palominos are inbred buffoons. The ratio of presidents to normal horses in the barn appears to be constant, 11 to 11. Rutherford keeps trying and failing to make these numbers add up to some explanation. 
Let's see. If I am the 19th president, but the fourth to arrive in the barn, and if 11 divided by 11 is 1, then mm, let me start again. He's still no closer to figuring out the algorithm that determined their rebirth here. Just because a ratio is stable does not make it meaningful, says James Garfield, a tranquil gray percheron, and Rutherford agrees. Then he goes back to his frantic cosmic arithmetic. The presidents feel certain that they are still in America, although there's no way for them to confirm this. The year, time still advances the way it did when they were president, is indeterminate. A day gets measured in different increments out here. Grass brightens and grass dims. Glass cobwebs spread across the tractor's window at dawn. Eisenhower claims that they are stabled in the past. The skies are empty, he knickers, not a B-52 in sight. To Rutherford, this new life hums with the strangeness of the future. The man has a cavalry of electric beasts that he rides over his acreage, ruby tractors and combines that would have caused Rutherford's constituents to fall off their buggies with shock. The man climbs into the high tractor seat and turns a tiny key, and then the engine roars and groans with an unintelligible hymn. Cherub's strumming harps couldn't have impressed Rutherford more than these baritone plows of the hereafter. Come back! That's not holy music, you dummy, Eisenhower yells. It's just diesel. 